organic effervescence to happen. So listen to people more, give some space for contestation, accept that people have differences of opinion, and how do you calibrate the space? That will be the challenge for the government of the future. <coughs> My so question. Oh, yeah. So uh, well, the liberal arts uh, program. Yeah. So, so the Singapore education system is based on um, the premise that you, know, you should offer different pathways uh, to, to people of different interests and different capabilities. So if you look at the educational difference, it's not a, a kind of a one-size-fits-all. You have vocational um, type training, the Institute of Technical Education, the polytechnics, so people who are more inclined to learn a skill and not um, academically inclined. Then you have the more traditional uh, high school, junior college, university, for those who are more interested in a more traditional way. And then, of course, you have the a liberal arts type. And even in, amongst the six universities, you have different types of universities. There's one um, that will cater to more people who want to upgrade from uh, after having a polytechnic diploma. So they are the more industry-oriented kind of people who have spent time in industry and want to get a degree after that. So it's, it's different type. Um, how far the liberal arts model will spread, I do not know. But obviously, looking at the workplace, and um, in this world of uncertainties where technology is dis disrupting the world, the, 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 the phrase we like to use is disruptions. Huh? Disruptions happening, happening so far, the uberization of things and so on. Then I think you need to produce young people who can adapt to these changes very quickly. So the traditional way of training, where you just say, learn one skill, and that skill will set you for the rest of your life, may not be applicable. So you need to be able to give some tr solid training so that people can function, but at the same time, inculcate in them the ability to learn how to learn so that learning continues. And this is what Singapore tries to do. Um, we used to believe uh, that uh, once you graduate with a degree at the age of 20 or 23, you are set for the rest of your life because what you have learned in those years is enough. It's no longer true, right? Because you know that if you don't have computer skills, you don't know how to read big uh, data and all this sort of thing, you're not going to be helpful in the new economy. So the learning period is now stretched, I believe, to age 45 and beyond. So you've got to continuous learning, otherwise you'll be left behind. So the old method, which we call PET, or pre-employment training, pre-employment training, that paradigm may be outdated. Now it's called Continuous Education and Training, CET. Singapore is moving into that. So once you do that, then you have to create different models. The liberal arts model could be one model where you train people to say, be broad, be open, and then you specialize later on. Or it could be the universities op offering more opportunities for people to say, I want to come back to the university. I've got a degree in accountancy, but now I feel that I don't have enough IT skills or my, my thinking is not broad enough, I don't understand the world, I want to take some political science modules, these are now possibilities. So in that sense, coming back to your question, sir, the whole idea of messing up uh, a very sort of clear, cut and dried approach may have to happen in Singapore, like it or not. And I think that's going to happen. Professor Tan, uh, how do you get the uh, general mentalities of the people in these two cities. I mean, uh, is there, uh, there is definitely basic, some basic differences uh, in uh, uh, psychology. And uh, is that conditioned by the difference in history, especially in uh, Calcutta, the partition and uh, things? Yeah, I, I, I actually, I can, can, can I just? Yeah. You know? Small question uh, following on, on that question is that uh, I, I was just thinking that you know you, you and I are sitting in the same table, but typically you are speaking like a true Singaporean, trying to enthuse us, trying to brighten us up, uh, trying to inspire us. Uh, and I am listening to you like a typical Calcutton, <laughs> cynically. I wanted, uh, I wanted to take you to the dark side and, and take, you know, just, just, just following on this question, because you, you know, you, you surveyed the, the, uh, y you know, the similarities between two poor cities, the comparison, uh, and eventually you come to, and the, the 19th century is a century when Singapore is. Um, a little, a little dot. Um, Calcutta is the second city of the British Empire. Uh, but when you come to 1946, 47, the decolonization period, we both go through decolonization. 
and then you you talk about a divergence, sort of a great divergence. Uh, and following on the question that was just made, I am also trying to wonder what the historical roots of this divergence because we go through a trauma uh, through the partition on which you have written so evocatively. Singapore also undergoes a trauma. It loses its hinterland in 1965. Uh, it is shocked to be separated from Malwa and so on and so forth. But what then, you know, the how does it overcome this trauma? What kind of mentalities, what kind of ambitions? So it, it, it's good to have ambitions, but there is also a transition from ambitions to capacity building. Why did that happen in the case of Singapore? And why uh, this did not happen in the case of uh, Calcutta? Is this, does this have something to do with a, 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 you know, a, a basic difference in mentality is something that Lee Kuan Yew, um, you know, uh, tried to propagate. And also a difference between the kind of leadership that, for example, Nehruvian India began to um, propagate, uh, a, a new, the, the, the imagining of a new nation state in India, and the kind of leadership that Lee Kuan Yew provided, the forging of a new national identity, when you are, you, you are coping with a shock, but still you are orienting your own mindset to, to embrace these ambitions and reorient. So is it what, what, what really happened that made you so uh, adept at, you know, to, 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 to be in sync with the 21st century? And why are we still trapped in the 19th century, which was our century, which was Calcutta century, Bengal century, and so on? You know, it's very difficult to essentialize this thing, so I, I will not try to uh, characterize uh, fairly or unfairly uh, the difference between Singapore, Singaporeans and Calcutans. Um, but I think there are some historical circumstances which I can try to explain uh, dif differences approach. And, uh, and thank you for helping me reframe this question. So the first, I think, is scale. Scale. Um, I always say that Singapore can do a lot of things because of its size, its smallness, its ability to uh, change things around very quickly when things don't work. I remember a minister telling me one day that, you know, I can fill in this room all the school principals and I'll tell them what I need the schools to do. And you can't do that in a subcontinental sized country, even in a state like West Bengal. The complexities are, are just very different. So scale, scale is one thing. I think two, uh, one mustn't underestimate the impact of leadership. Um, Singapore was fortunate to have, uh, at that time, uh, a very determined set of leaders who were quite selfless. I mean, Singapore could go the way of any post-colonial third world country. Corruption was an example. Corruption. I mean, you, you know, once you have corrupted leaders, that's it, no matter what you do. Um, and we were lucky for some reason that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, his first cabinet, were quite selfless, what I call social reformers. They were not just politicians, they were social reformers. They wanted to show that they could build a Singapore once they came out of Malaysia. And they would build a Singapore to show, in a way, and if there are Malaysians here, I hope I don't offend you, to show that the Malaysia ha Mal Malaysians haven't gotten it right. One, affirmative action. You don't frame social policies on the basis of race. If you have affirmative action, you're going to create a lot of trouble because nobody feels that, you know, if you're not born of that race, you, you don't belong to that country. So meritocracy became important. Multiculturalism became important. So you are who you are based on your merit and what you're worth. So that, that was what they wanted to form. And then in an interesting sort of way, they needed to stay open to the rest of the world because they could also take a kind of a, oh, you know, we had suffered so many years under the British and under the Malaysians and therefore we will now turn inwards and become super nationalistic. And Singapore rejected it. That's why we have this funny situation where we have a statue of Sir Stanford Raffles sitting proudly by the side of the Singapore River. People were amused by that. In fact, even Singaporeans say, why are we commemorating Raffles, you know, who is obviously an imperialist, right, uh, as like a founding father. There was a good political reason for that in 1965 because on the advice of a Dutch economist called Winsemius, he, he advised Lee Kuan Yew, the two things you have to do. First, defeat the communists. Huh? Defeat the communists. So it might resonate with the people here. Defeat the communists because communists will turn inwards and they won't care about trade and then you can't prosper as a result of that. Two, don't, don't show the world that you are going to turn inwards but that you will continue to want to trade 
with the West and become an open city like it was when you were in colonial rule. So the symbolic representation was Raffles. So don't throw Raffles into the river, keep his statue there and show the world. So I think that kind of leadership, that framing, um, look outward looking, progressive, tough, and yet uncorrupt, I think these are some of the qualities of, of the, the leader. So that's the second factor. I think the third factor, and this is something that a lot, not a lot of people have thought about, is Singapore actually was a new society in 1965, a new society. And Lee Kuan Yew had in fact said it himself, that he was in the process of building a new society. You know, the government was so interventionist. I think if this happened in Singapore, there, uh, in, 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 in India, there will be lots of protests. He told people when to get married, how many children to have, which school you should go to, and so on. Intervene in everything. It was, you know, it was total intervention. But he felt he needed to do so because this was such a mixed immig a migrant population, nothing in common. So we had all sorts of campaigns. Do not spit, uh, do not spit on the ground, um, flush your toilets, <laughs> use English, because he was trying to create a new mentality in the people. And maybe he succeeded in the 30 years. But I guess in all societies, all societies where you have civilizational history to change that, maybe, more, maybe much more difficult, much more difficult. So I would say three things. One is the circumstances of the time, the leadership scale, circumstances of time and leadership, and then I think uh, whether the ability to build a new society or you are inheriting or you are working on the basis of an, an, an old mentality that is very hard to change. Yeah. Thank you for a very fascinating uh, lecture and even Janto's point. I appreciate very much. Um, when I went to Singapore in the 70s, as early as that, I found people very, very westernized. Now, was there a conscious effort? Because uh, the effect of that, I find over the years, especially impacted Singapore in taking on to Western classical music, mm. ballet in the Western form. And uh, is it because of a very conscious effort, as I said, to be Westernized? And in that case, you, that case you, can, get, you can project a more perhaps acceptable um, situation in Western countries. They will accept you. Whereas in Cal again, looking at Calcutta from the other side, right, we went through British rule. But uh, this, in fact, anybody who tried to be westernized, or even today, if I speak in English, people don't like it, as simple as that. They want me to speak in Bangla. So I don't know whether it's excessive nationalism or whatever is playing over here, but uh, why did, uh, and what is your national dress, if I can ask a simple question? What is a, a typical thing? <laughs> We're still trying to figure out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, okay. There, there were attempts at developing some sort of a batik with the orchid. Orchid is a national yes, flower. Yes, okay. Uh, but it, it didn't take off. It didn't take off. Okay. So we, we still don't have a national dress. So if someone said, come in your national dress, usually the word is interesting. They don't use national. They say ethnic, ethnic. or yeah, traditional. So I, I could come in a batik shirt or a Chinese uh, shirt or a uh, 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 kind of a kurta or whatever, depending on how I feel about it. And that's the beauty of it because it's so open. Yes, so open. Yes. Yeah. Now, in answer to your question, Thank I think you. that was a, is, is a combination of two things. Uh, one is a, a, practic a practical question because Singaporeans, uh, uh, the Singapore approach has always been known as pragmatic. So basically, at that time, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, I mean, where were the centers of the world? I mean, you try to learn from America. American culture was very big. The, U, uh, the UK and then the U Europe, right? So I think that that was uh, um, an outcome of necessity because those, those were your main trading partners. And English was then adopted. Um, and this, I have to thank uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew for his foresight because he could have turned nationalistic and say, no, let's throw English out and let's all either speak Chinese or Malay or Indian or Tamil, right? And he did not do that because he knew that English was the language of trade, administration, and science and technology, R&D that if you didn't have it, you're going to lose out. So he was very clear about that. But the second part was circumstantial. Now, if you think of the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, look around the neighborhood of Singapore. Who could we turn to? China was still close, communist. In fact, I still remember seeing a passport. We could not travel to China on our passport, restricted. India had what I call that sense of benign neglect to Southeast Asia. 
right? Because India had in, enough to do within the region, as it was not interested in Southeast Asia. So, so we couldn't turn to India. Southeast Asia was in the midst of Cold War, communist threat, Saigon, Vietnam, Laos, um, and then Indonesia was also trying to rebuild. So where were our models? They were all in the West. I think that's going to change with the Asian century and what you call it, and things are going to look very different. So um, maybe Donald Trump is doing us a great favor, I don't know. But I can tell you there's an impact. There's an impact because students are now, for my, my own students, are, not, are less keen to go and study in the US. I mean, they're looking for opportunities elsewhere because they feel that that's not the place they want to go to. So I think uh, while we all want to think that, you know, he's, he's a bit of a joke, but the point is that it will have a long-term impact. With China getting its act together, India, you know, becoming the, the, the power that it's destined to be, Southeast Asia getting its act together, I think this region is going to make the difference and you're going to see a shift. So hopefully Singapore will be in the best of two worlds, right? Its ability to engage confidently the West with English, technology, but at the same time, comfortable in its own skin as an Asian country. And I think that's going to make Singapore quite distinctive. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Tan, you have surveyed such a wide ground. You have uh, given us um, so many insights. And, and thank you so much for the grace in taking these questions. Uh, it, it's very interesting that you talked about Singapore, um, people in Singapore being so westernized and there is so much openness, so much fondness for Western classical music and so on and so forth. But that's the same Singapore where people are also questioning why Sir Stamford Raffles' statue is there because he is an imperialist. And it's quite interesting that while we are moving this sort of opposite way increasingly, we are still having this conversation in the Victoria Memorial Hall, uh, uh, which is the only address on a road that still is called the Queen's Way. Uh, so, so, um, so thank you so much uh, for, for your enthusiasm, your um, optimism, and I really hope that that rubs off on us as we take baby steps into the 21st century. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just one minute more, please. I would like to now request uh, Dr. Raja Mohan, the director of the uh, yes. Institute for South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, to propose Sorry a Sorry to of make thanks. you sit again. I mean, I think it won't take long. Uh, it's really, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening uh, for making it such a wonderful uh, engagement between all of you and uh, uh, Professor Tayong. Professor Tayong, uh, thank you for coming here. I know how busy you are, and uh, you taking two night flights, one night flight in and one night flight out tomorrow. So it's really uh, wonderful to have you here and, and begin this engagement. Uh, and then I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Jayanto Sengupta for giving us this privilege of coming to Victoria Memorial and to start uh, this collaboration and to have this event in this wonderful historic uh, setting. I also want to thank uh, the CII and the Singapore Bicentennial Office for supporting this. But in the end, I mean, I just want to just say a couple of things about what you said. I mean, I think there's enough reason to be optimistic uh, that actually uh, that India is changing. And as India shut down, Calcutta also shut down. But today, as India opens up, I think today we are at a $2.8 trillion economy. And the changes in India, everything is subtle. I mean, there's so chaos at the top. But uh, out of $2.8 trillion economy that we have, uh, $1.1 trillion is India's exports and imports. This is a very different India. I mean, India that is deeply connected to the rest of the world. 40% of our economy today is linked to the world. So in some sense, of the 19th century India, which was far more just a few cities that were connected today, uh, in India is globalizing. India is going to be connected to the world. Second, I think there's also region is changing. Uh, you mentioned Bengal presidency. I mean, I have a friend from Dhaka who tells me the Bengal presidency is coming back. <laughs> that is, if you think of Singapore was part of Calcutta, uh, Burma was part run from Calcutta till 1930s, that today the globalization and regional integration is going to turn Bay of Bengal into a renewed integration that is taking place. I mean, someone asked, why can't we do sea cruises? Actually, uh, the idea of liberalizing rules for coastal shipping uh, of shipping connectivity between Dhaka, Calcutta, Madras, uh, Burma, all these are beginning to happen. So I think we're going to see a lot more integration. And finally, the small and big, 
I mean, you said Singapore is small, India is very big, too big, Singapore is too small. But I think that is actually too a, a, a factor that's connecting us. Because today I walk in Singapore campus in the university, I see these young Indians, someone doing biology, someone doing digital stuff, full of Indians speaking in all possible Indian languages around us, all in the 30s. So what it tells us is that, look, Singapore has become an innovation capital. That is inno extraordinary innovation. Many Indian companies, young startups, go there for support. But for scale, you have to come back to India. So actually, there is a, there's an interconnection. Singapore is a place where you can do the innovation. India gives you the scale uh, to do imaginative, to do interesting things. And I think that's going to uh, put us back together. So we think it's the beginning of a beautiful relationship uh, with Victoria Memorial. And we hope uh, we'll continue to engage both uh, uh, Calcutta as well as other cities in this part of uh, Bay of Bengal. And we look forward to working with you on future agenda. Thank you very much again for taking us. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajabhan. Uh, Professor Tan, thank you very much. Uh, your relationship with Calcutta this time has been a one-night stand. <laughs> yeah? so, because you fly in one night and go out the next night. So we welcome you once again to discover this city <laughs> about which you have been talking a lot. So please do come back and we'll be delighted to have you back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good passage home.